My week? Weekend. Oh, I don't know. It was just a weekend. <laughs> yeah. It happens. It was good and bad all at the same time. And now we're here. Okay. So. I got all right so let's get started um just by way of recap i won't write it down but what we were discussing last time was this methods to calculate electric fields. And the way we did it is we started by writing down Coulomb's law, Coulomb's law, the force between two point charges. And then we said, all right, we could take a different picture. We could say that point charge Q1 creates an electric field that fills space. And then if there's a nearby point charge Q2, it interacts with that electric field of the first point charge Q1 and experiences a force that's equal to Q2 times the electric field by ex, uh, created by Q1. Um, and then we said, well, that's fine, but what if we had like some complicated collection of charges? Well, then we could just say, we could use the superposition principle, which says that I could calculate the electric field at some point where our test charge is, and I'll do that for every single uh, of every single point charge we have, um, source charge, and then I'll add them all up as vectors. I'll get the total electric field, and then if I place a test charge there, it'll just be Q times that total electric field is the force on it. Um, and then we said, okay, that's all fine. Um, what if we have really like a huge number of these point charges that they make like some continuous charge distribution? And then we said, okay, we can have lines of charge, we can have surfaces covered in charge, or we can have some volume of charge. And we wrote down ways that we could do those calculations. Um, in general, those calculations can be difficult to do because we have to think about the symmetry, which components of the electric field are gonna be important, how are those components gonna combine when we add them up from different source charges. Um, so what we're gonna do for the next little while is develop different techniques that allow us to calculate electric fields using these various methods. And then it may be that some methods are good in certain situations and other methods in other situations. So the first method that we're gonna talk about is Gauss's law. And so this is 2.2 in Griffiths. Um, so, Calculating E from, uh, or let's say due to continuous 
charge distributions is possible using the methods discussed previously. Um, but in some situations, those calculations can be cumbersome. So we want some new methods to find E. Okay, um, and so the first method that we will look at is this Gauss's law. And Gauss's law is all about calculating flux. So the way we're gonna start is we're gonna start by calculating, oops, calculating the flux of the electric field through a surface that surrounds surrounds a point charge. Um, we're going to start with a point charge because that's one that's easy to work with. We already know the electric field of a point charge. It's one over four pi epsilon naught q divided by r squared, and it points radially away from that point charge if it's positive. Um, Okay, so to make this calculation easy, what we'll do is we'll pick a spherical surface with the point charge at the center. We're going to relax all these restrictions in just a second, but this will be our starting point. And in fact, this starting point actually is going to reveal to us um, when it's going to be easy to use Gauss's law. Gauss's law, when we write it down, it will always be true. It's just difficult to implement unless we satisfy a few conditions. All right, and so let me draw what this would look like. Uh, I'm going to draw this as a 2D picture, but really what you have to imagine is that this is a three-dimensional sphere, okay? So this is going to be our spherical surface. We will ultimately call this a Gaussian surface. The Gaussian surface could be a real physical surface, or it could be just some imagined surface. Um, and then we'll place our point charge in the center. Um, I'll make it a positive point charge just so that we have something to draw. And then we know the electric field points radially away from this positive point charge. And so I'm drawing the electric field lines as continuous lines. Um, really, every point in space uh, you could draw a different electric field vector for all those points. When we draw continuous lines, the strength of the electric field is given by the density of the lines. So if you imagine a two-dimensional surface and you count the number of lines divided by the surface area of that surface, that defines the density and the electric field strength is proportional to that density. So here, where there's a lot of lines uh, concentrated in a small area, that's where the electric field is strong. And then out here, they have more spread out and that's where the electric field is weak. Um, the reason that I'm highlighting that is because we're gonna calculate the electric flux, which is gonna be the electric field strength times uh, surface area and then integrate over the entire surface. Um, so if the electric field strength is the number of field lines occurring in an area, then this flux integral, E times dA, or dot dA, is like E times area, 
that's going to be just proportional to the number of lines that actually cross our surface. Okay, so the electric field strength is proportional to the density of lines. So this is IE, the number of lines per unit area crossing a surface. So for example, if I have a surface here, oh, where, there it is. Oh, where'd you go? So if I had uh, some kind of surface like this, I could count the number of lines that cross that surface and multiply it by whatever they are divided by the area of that surface. And that's going to be proportional to the strength of the field. Okay. Um, all right. So the flux, we'll have to note by capital phi. I'll put a subscript E to say that this is the electric flux because later we'll calculate the magnetic flux. Um, that's determined by this E dot dA integral. And so this is like the electric field strength times the area, but the electric field strength is the number of lines per unit area, and then we multiply by area. And so flux is proportional to the number of lines crossing your surface. So with that in mind, what if I went over here and said, okay, instead of using this black surface, maybe I'll use um, this purple one. And so I'll pick a purple one that's a little bit smaller than the black one. How does the flux through the purple and black surfaces compare? They're the same, right? If it's true that the flux is proportional to the number of lines crossing our surface, the black and purple ones have the exact same number of lines crossing the surface. Um, I could have easily also drawn a spherical surface that's bigger than the black one and the flux would still be the same. You could also change the shape. And I'm going to change the shape, yeah. Yeah. So the uh, the black and uh, purple spheres. Uh, whoops, that's not going to spell spheres. Have same flux since the same number of lines cross those surfaces. Okay, and so you're exactly right. I could come back in here and I say, um, all right, let me take some rectangular surface. Uh, again, imagine that this is a 3D surface, so it's some kind of a rectangular box type thing. Um, and then I go and I count how many lines cross that surface, and I say, well, it's the same number of lines, so it has the same flux. This is a little more subtle because in the first case, when we had spherical surfaces, the electric field lines were always perpendicular to the surface. And so that means that the dot product is easy to evaluate because the radial electric field lines are parallel to the DA vectors, which are normal to the surface. And so the dot product just always gives one. So I could do this calculation easily for the spherical surfaces. For the rectangular one, you can see that the dot product is going to be complicated because I'm going to have DA vectors that are always going to be pointing normal to the surface. But then now I have electric field lines crossing at some angle. And so that dot product 
everywhere on the green surface, the angle theta is always changing. And that means it would be a really difficult calculation to do in practice, yet it's still true that if we could do it, the flux would have to be the same, okay? So we could say that likewise, the rectangular green surface also uh, has the same flux, although actually evaluating d dot da would be very difficult. Okay, so that's the first point. Um, so let's go and actually do the calculation for a sphere of radius r with the point charge at the center. So for a sphere of radius r with q at the center, we want to evaluate um, this electric flux is equal to E dot dA. Okay, um, E is gonna be one over four pi epsilon naught Q over R squared, and it's in the radial direction. And then dA in spherical coordinates is, uh, let's see, it's going to be r squared on the surface. R is going to be constant uh, and equal to capital R. And then we're going to have a sine theta d theta d phi. And the definition of this dA vector is that the direction points radially outwards from our spherical surface. So it's perpendicular normal to the surface and pointing out. And so that is the r hat direction. So this is in general the electric field. At the surface, r is going to be constant and equal to capital R. And so this is going to be 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught q over capital R squared r hat at the surface. Okay, that means that E dot dA is going to be 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught Q over R squared. Um, then we have R hat dotted with R squared sine theta d theta d phi R hat. So the R's cancel and we're left with one over four pi epsilon naught. I'll write it as Q over four pi epsilon naught. R hat dot R hat is just gonna be a one. And then we'll have our sine theta d theta d phi. So that if I want to actually calculate this integral, the electric flux is going to be bunch of constants q over four pi epsilon naught and then we have the integral of sine theta d theta d phi over our sphere surface and that's going to be a factor of four pi so sine theta would go from zero to pi i'm uh, sorry theta would go zero to pi so the sine theta integral is going to give a factor of two Phi goes from zero to pi, so we pick up two pi from the d phi integral. And so this is four pi. And so the final result is just q over epsilon naught. Um, all right. Now what that tells us is that we've done the calculation for the sphere and we get q over epsilon naught. Uh, so it must be also q over epsilon naught for the rectangle. And we could now say, well, what if we had a sphere, but we move our charge off center? 
So if Q is moved off center, then we would have, here's our spherical surface. And I don't know, I could put Q over here. And now I draw my electric field. What's the flux now? Again, it's the same. If all we're doing is counting the number of lines that cross the surface, that flux doesn't change. Again, that would be a terrible calculation to try to do. Um, but you can sort of get an understanding of why it works. Um, over here, we have a strong electric field that's acting over a relatively small patch of area on that surface. And so we're getting a strong contribution of the flux here. Uh, over here, we have weak electric field, right? The lines are spread far apart, but they act over a large area of the sphere. So the product of E times A, the weak electric field and the large area compensates. It's because the electric field is falling as one over R squared and the area is proportional to R squared of the sphere, okay? Um, so if Q is moved off center, we still have the same number of electric field lines crossing the surface and the flux is unchanged. Okay, good. Um, so now we want to extend this a little bit further. Like what if we had a collection of point charges inside of our surface? So what if there are multiple point charges inside our surface? Well, okay, so the electric flux is going to be the integral of the net electric field, but I can use superposition principle to write down my net electric field as the sum of the fields due to all the individual point charges. I have to do a dot DA here. Um, but I can reorder the sum and the integral. And so I could say, well, this is the same thing as the sum of i equals one to n of the integral of ei dot da. But now this is just the flux of a single point charge. And we've already calculated that. That has to be just qi over epsilon naught. And so what we end up with is sum of i equals one to n of qi, and then there's a one over epsilon naught factor. But now this sum over qi is just adding up all of the charge that's inside of our surface. So if I was to draw a picture, um, I don't have to have my surfaces spherical anymore. I can make them whatever shape I want. So this is my Gaussian surface. And now I could put Q1 and Q2 and Q3 and Q4 and whatever, however many you want. And so now the sum of I equals one to N of QI is just gonna be denoted Q enclosed, which is the total charge. Uh, contained or enclosed within our Gaussian surface. So in that case, Gauss's law becomes the following. So Gauss's law is always a calculation of the electrical flux. And so that is the electric flux. And Gauss's law says 
that that has to be equal to Q enclosed over epsilon naught. So the beauty of this is that I don't care about the details of the shape of the surface. Uh, if, if all I want to do is find the flux enclosed by the surface, I don't care about the shape of the surface, and I don't care um, how the charges are arranged inside that surface. All I care about is the total Q flows, and then I just divide that by a constant. Now, in practice, what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to use Gauss's law to calculate electric fields. And in that case, I will care about the details of the surface and how we go about uh, evaluating this surface integral. Okay, um, so that's Gauss's law. Um, what I wanna do is I wanna imagine what happens if we have charges that are sitting outside of the surface. Okay, so what if we have nearby charges that are outside our surface? Um, okay, uh, well, let's think about that. Um, I'll try to draw a Gaussian surface here and I'll try to I'll try to indicate that this thing does have some like three-dimensional structure here. So this is like a, I don't know, a Cheeto or something like that. Okay. And what we've got here is our Gaussian surface. And we'll place some charges, Q1, two, three, or something like that. Um, and then I'll put one out here, U5. Um, so clearly, in this case, Q enclosed is equal to Q1 plus Q2 plus Q3 plus Q4. And so the flux is just equal to that sum divided by epsilon naught. And so evidently, Q5 doesn't contribute any flux whatsoever. And what I want to do is see if we can understand why that's the case. So I'm going to just draw some electric field lines. These ones that I've drawn so far don't even cross the surface, so I don't care about them. And so there's going to be a few more that are kind of going out like this. But then we have one that's coming down, and maybe it punctures our surface there. It keeps going and it punctures it again and comes out. And then we have one that comes in here, enters our surface, and then exits, and then finally one more. Uh, maybe it crosses here, goes on for a little while, and comes out. So what's the reason that Q5 doesn't contribute any net flux if it, it clearly has some lines going through our surface? Yeah, that's right. So the calculation of the flux is E dot DA. So for our little blue surface, um, if I put a normal vector here, it has to point outward. So it points something like this. And, but over here, our normal vector also points outward, but that happens to be kind of pointing a little bit downwards. Uh, so if we imagine this dot product that we have to evaluate, at the top, the electric field line and n hat are closer to anti-parallel. And so that means we're gonna have something like cos of 180, or at least the cos of something that's between 90 and 180, and that's going to be negative. So where, so let's, let's think, how do I want to do this? E dot DA 
is less than zero when E and DA are approximately anti-parallel. And these contribute negative effects. Okay, so when E dot DA is positive when E and DA are approximately parallel. And so these contribute positive flux. So the argument is that for charges outside our surface, the positive and negative contributions to the electric flux exactly cancel. Now, here, let's see if I can get this picture back on. It's not obvious that they cancel exactly unless you really buy the argument, which is true, that we're sort of counting the number of lines that cross our surface. So we have in our drawing, we have three electric field lines entering the surface and three electric field lines exiting the surface. And so by that logic, it should contribute zero flux. The other way to think of it is similar to what we argued just a second ago, near the top, our surface is close to Q5. And so there the electric field due to Q5 is strong. And that strong electric field is concentrated over a relatively small area of our surface. And so we have a strong electric field times a smaller surface area, and that's overall negative. So that's negative flux. Out here, we have a weak electric field, but it extends over a large surface area. So this weak electric field times a large area, making a positive contribution to the flux, that balances the negative one uh, on the upper half. Okay, so that's the idea. Okay, um, so the last thing I want to do before we get into some examples, I think we're going to do examples after this, I hope. Yeah, I think we will. Okay, good. So, <clears throat> Before doing our first example, let's apply the divergence theorem. To Gauss's law. We've actually done this before, so I won't spend a lot of time on this. So Gauss's law says that uh, the electric flux is E dot DA over a closed surface, uh, and that has to be equal to Q enclosed over epsilon naught. Okay, um, but we know that E dot DA over a closed surface for any vector field by the divergence theorem is the integral over a volume of the divergence of E, uh, and then d tau is our volume element. Um, well, so that must also be equal to Q enclosed over epsilon naught. Uh, sorry, I think I've been using capital Q. Let me see if I can be consistent. Okay, but the total charge in a volume is just equal to the density, the charge density, charge per unit volume, integrated over that volume. And so if we make that comparison, now we have the same integral over the same volume. And so the integrands must be equal. 
And so that implies that the divergence of E is equal to rho over epsilon naught. I shouldn't have included the d tau in my underline there. Okay, and this is also Gauss's law. It's just written in differential form. And so what we have now is Gauss's law expressed in two ways. E dot dA is Q imposed over epsilon naught, and this is the integral form. This is the form that we're going to use when we actually try to use Gauss's law to find electric fields of different charge distributions. And then the differential form is this divergence, is the charge density divided by epsilon naught. And so this differential form. Okay. So um, let's see if we can work out an example. So while Gauss's law is always true, It is only easy to apply when we satisfy the following conditions. Okay, one is we want to pick a surface that matches the symmetry of the electric field. So that at our surface, we want the electric field to either be parallel or perpendicular to our surface area. So E should be parallel or perpendicular to DA everywhere on the surface. This is going to allow us to evaluate the dot product. Uh, specifically, the dot product between E and dot and DA. OK, but that's not quite enough. Um, when the dot product doesn't vanish, so uh, when we get non-zero values for E and DA, so when they're not perpendicular, the magnitude of the electric field should be zero or constant at every point on our surface. Um, and the reason we want to do that is because if E is going to be a constant, it's going to allow us to pull it outside of the integral. And that's what we need in order to evaluate, right? Think about it. Like if we're going to use Gauss's law to determine the electric field, then I don't know its value. And so it better not be inside the integral other because then I can't evaluate the integral. So wherever, wherever E dot DA is not zero, we require uh, the magnitude of E to be zero or constant. I don't need to say zero or constant. I guess zero is constant, but nevertheless, that's fine. So that E can be factored out of the integral. Okay. Good. So those, uh, we're going to do an example now. And what we'll try to do is we'll try to confirm that we meet all of these two conditions that we set out. So example, a long cylinder carries 
a charge density. Uh, let's say rho is k times s squared. Um, so we're going to use uh, cylindrical formants. I think this is the first problem where we use cylindrical uh, formants in the class. The way Griffiths does cylindrical formants, s is the radial uh, variable, the distance from the z-axis. So z is another one of the coordinates. And then phi goes from 0 to 2 pi. So s is the radial coordinate in cylindrical coordinates. So what this charge density is saying is that the amount of charge in our cylinder is growing as we move away from the um, cylindrical axis. So the problem is if the cylinder is radius A, find E at points with S less than A. So this will be inside our cylinder and at points for S greater than A, which will be outside our cylinder. Okay. Uh, so we'll start with S less than A. All right, uh, so we'll start by drawing our cylinder. And so our cylinder maybe looks something like this. I'll draw the cylindrical axis. Um, this is a long cylinder, so I've drawn just a section of it. It really goes to plus infinity and minus infinity. And so the diameter, or sorry, the radius of the cylinder is A. Okay, and I'll draw the axis of the cylinder uh, through the whole length there. All right. What's the reason that we have to specify that our cylinder is very long? What would be the problem if we had a short cylinder? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So if we had just a section, in the center, the electric field would be perpendicular. But then on the ends, they would start to feel away. And that's going to make evaluating Gauss's law impossible. But if this just keeps going on and on and on, then at any point on the cylinder, I have equal charge to the right and to the left. And so that means the electric field must be perpendicular. Now, of course, in practice, you never have an infinitely long cylinder. So really what we're going to be interested in is what is the electric field close to the surface of a cylinder? Um, that way, if, if we make our distance from the cylinder small compared to its length, then for all effective purposes, this is like an infinitely long cylinder, okay? All right, so some things that we know is that E will always be radial. So therefore, E is going to be the S components in the S hat direction. That's it. OK, so that's fine. Um, so Let's pick a Gaussian surface. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna place my Gaussian surface uh, inside because we're considering the case where we're at some point inside. We'll make the radius of this Gaussian surface S. So this is my Gaussian surface. And it's gonna have a length L. All right, so we have to do two calculations. One is we have to calculate the flux, and two, we have to calculate the Q and close. So let's start with 
um, e.da integrated over our Gaussian service. Okay. Uh, well, if I take a patch of area on my Gaussian surface, this has area dA, and it points out in the S hat direction. So E dot dA is going to be equal to ES S hat dot product with dA uh, also in the S hat direction. And this is just going to be ES dA. But we have to be careful because my, my little red cylinder is a closed cylinder. So how many parts are there to the surface? Three of them. There's the curved surface, and then there's the ends, the end on the left and the end on the right. What I've done here is only for the curved surface. So this is for the curved surface. Okay. What if I took a little DA over here? Then if, let me define my Z axis. Let's say Z is horizontal and to the right. So this one is in the minus Z hat direction. So if we do the left end, E dot DA is gonna be, well, the electric field is still radial, but now we have a DA in the minus Z hat direction. What's this dot product gonna be? Zero, right? The DA and the radial electric field are perpendicular. Same thing for the right end. In this case, the DA for the right end will be the plus direction. Okay, so that means this integral that we have to evaluate is made up of the three parts, E dot DA. So let's do like the left end plus E dot DA for the right end and then plus E dot DA, the curve surface. And we've already argued that the first two are gonna be zero. So this is what we were saying in our conditions for applying Gauss's law successfully. We want the electric field to be either perpendicular to DA, or parallel to DA so that we can evaluate the dot products. And we've satisfied that condition so that what we have now is the integral over the curved surface of the S component of the electric field times the DA, the surface area element on the curved surface. Um, what was the other condition that we were gonna try to satisfy? E perpendicular or parallel to the surface. What was the other one we wrote down? Um, what about the magnitude of this thing? Constant, right? And so let's look at our picture. That curved surface is concentric with the axis of our cylinder. That means if I'm sitting on this red surface, wherever I am, the curved part of it, I'm always the same distance from the axis. And so I would expect then that because I have a symmetric charge distribution, that the strength of the electric field is everywhere the same at all points on that curved surface. Okay. So since our Gaussian surface, uh, the curved part specifically. Is always. The same. 
distance s from the cylinder axis es is constant. and can be taken outside the integral. Okay, so that means our calculation of the flux is boiled down to just being the S component, which is the only non-zero component, times the integral of dA over the curved surface. But now the integral of dA is just the area of the curved surface. What is the area of the curved surface? It has length L and radius um, S. No, you're overcomplicating this. So, um, I'm asking for the surface area, not the cross-sectional area. Two pi L. Yeah, two pi S L. Because oh, right. I'm looking at the yes. red one. Yep. Um, so the way to imagine that is imagine you take this little cylinder made out of paper, you cut it and then roll it out. So it'll be a rectangle one side of length L, the other side of the circumference two pi S, and so the area is two pi S times L. So this should be two pi S times L. And so therefore our flux should be equal to ES two pi S times L. Um, so that's good, we've made some progress. We still don't actually know what this electric field is um, because we haven't done the other side of Gauss's law. I will just emphasize now that we're gonna have to do this calculation again when we look at a point outside the cylinder. Um, but is there gonna be anything different about this calculation inside and outside? No, it's nothing. We're still gonna say that the electric field's radial. We're still gonna say that the electric field is constant when we're the same distance away from the cylinder axis. We're still gonna calculate the area of our curved Gaussian surface. It's still gonna be two pi S times L. We're just, S will be bigger because we'll consider S greater than A, but the calculation is the same. So let's just note that this result will be the same inside and outside. So that means for S less than A and for S greater than A. So when we go to do the outside part, we're not gonna repeat this calculation. We're just gonna make use of the fact that we've already done it. Okay. So that was the start with the E dot DA. So next, we're going to consider uh, Q enclosed over epsilon naught. Okay, um, Q enclosed is the integral of rho d tau over our Gaussian surface. Now in cylindrical coordinates, what's d tau going to be? Uh, it's going to be uh, s ds d phi uh, dz. Okay, uh, so if ds has units of length, dz has units of length, S D phi is the arc length when we have an angular displacement. And so S has units of length. So this has to be. So that makes sense. Um, rho, we were given, I think, what did they say it was? Uh, K S squared. Okay. 
Uh, so let's just do it then. This is going to be the integral over our Gaussian surface. Um, and so it's going to be k s squared s ds d phi dz. OK, let's think about the limits of the integration. We have a cylinder of length L. And so that means Z is going to go from zero to L. What did I use? Capital L or little L? I use little L. The radial dimension is going to go zero to S. So maybe what I'll do is I'll put primes on this thing so as not to confuse S prime squared and this is going to be ds ds prime. So S prime will go from zero, the axis of our cylinder, to S, the radius of our Gaussian surface. And then uh, phi, because we have a complete cylinder, will go zero to two pi. OK, uh, so let's see. Q enclosed, therefore, should be K the integral of zero to two pi of d phi, the integral of zero to L of dz, the integral of S prime is zero to S, and then what do we have? We have S cubed. So this is gonna be two pi, this is gonna be L, this is going to be, uh, sorry, I should fix my notation, S prime cubed DS prime. Prime S prime squared. Uh, so it's going to be S prime to the fourth over four, evaluate between zero and S. So it should be S to the fourth over four, I think. OK, so Q enclosed is therefore equal to, let's see, we get pi over 2 times L times K times S to the fourth. All right. So let's see, can I get all of this thing on there? Right. So now we've done the two calculations that are required for Gauss's law, Q flows and the flux integral. So now we just have to set them equal to each other after dividing Q enclosed uh, by epsilon naught. So therefore, this Gauss's law requires uh, so let's see, what was the integral? E S two pi S L. E S two pi S L is equal to pi L K S to the fourth divided by two. And let's see what happens. One thing you might have wondered is I drew that red cylindrical Gaussian surface and I picked an arbitrary length. And so, you know, if I chose a longer length, I would have more enclosed charge, but I would also have more flux through that surface. And as you can see here, the length cancels. And so it's completely arbitrary. You can pick whatever length you want. It's not going to change the results. Um, what else could we do? We could get rid of a pi. We could get rid of one factor of s. Um, and if we then solve for E S, what do we get? Um, K S cubed over two divided by divided by two, we get a four. I forgot something. What did I forget? Yep. So I'm gonna divide Q close by epsilon naught. And let's see if did I get the right answer? Yes, I think I did. So then we have that E is K S cubed or four epsilon naught, and it's in the radial direction. And this is for 
points that are inside our cylinder. Okay. So is there any questions about that part of it? Does that make sense? All right. So what I want to do is I want to do a point outside of the cylinder. Um, but like I said, we're not going to repeat the integral part of the problem because that's the same. So this will be part two. So S greater than A, this is a point outside. So I guess I'll draw it, although the picture is going to look pretty similar. There'll only be one difference. This is uh, our radius A. There's our central axis. And now our Gaussian surface will sit outside here we'll say this is length L and this is the length S. S is bigger now, but we're still, it's still a radial distance S away from the axis. So in this case, E dot DA is equal to um, the radial electric field times the area of the Gaussian surface, two pi s times L is exactly the same. Okay, so then the only thing we have to do is to find Q and close. What's gonna be different about Q and close when we calculate it this time? We have a vision for it that's moving the S before this S. Yeah. So especially the specific. Well, no, it won't be. What is the what is the charge density between here and here? Zero. Zero. So we're gonna to have to cut off our integral of Q and close so that we don't include the part of the volume of the Gaussian surface that is not containing any charge. In other words, in the first example, we cut off our integral at the Gaussian surface. In the second example here, we're gonna to have to cut off our integral at the surface of the actual cylinder that carries the charge. So Q enclosed is gonna be the integral of rho d tau, but now this integral is over the cylinder uh, let's, to be cylinders, there's two cylinders. Let's say the charge cylinder. Okay. Um, I think it was, it was a KS squared. Is that what it was? I think so. Where the hell did it go? KS squared. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, this is going to be the integral of K. I'll put it as S prime, uh, squared, and then our d tau is going to be s prime, ds prime, d phi, uh, and dz. We're going to have a z integral from 0 to l. We're going to have a phi integral from 0 to 2 pi. And then we're going to have a s prime integral from 0 to a. And that's the important part, is we cut this off at the actual cylinder the charged cylinder boundary. Okay, um, so we're gonna get K comes out. We'll get a two pi from the phi integral. We'll get an L from the Z integral. And then we have S prime cubed. So we'll just do S prime cubed, DS prime, uh, zero to A. I think that's probably right. Uh, and so let's see, we're going to get a to the fourth over four. And so it's going to be k pi l a to the fourth over two, I think. Let me see. 
view enclosed is pi k eight and four. Yeah. All right. I want to do so. Okay. So fine. Let's let's think about the charge per unit length of our cylinder. <laughs> so we call linear charge densities, charges per unit length lambda. And so it's just going to be the total charge, Q enclosed, divided by um, the length of our red Gaussian surface, L. And that's just going to be K by A to the fourth over two. So let's just keep that in mind. If we wanted to define a charge per unit length, this is what we would get. OK. So this is just a bit of an aside. All right. So now this integral of E dot DA is Q enclosed over epsilon naught, just to finish off Gauss's law. Um, this is ES two pi, uh, A, sorry, S times L, was it? Yeah, I think it's two pi S times L. Yep. And then Q enclosed is K pi A to the fourth over two. Uh, there is a factor of L there. And let me not forget epsilon naught this time. OK, so we could do some cancellation. Um, so, oh, nope, not that. Pi cancels, L cancels. Um, then we're going to have a two times two in the denominator. And so I think we get ES is going to be equal to K A to the fourth over four epsilon naught S. Um, is that right? think so. Okay, so that's fine. Then that means that E, if we want to write it as a vector, is something like this. And that's fine. What I want to do is I just want to see if we can re-express this thing in terms of a charge per unit length. So we have k pi a to the fourth over two. Um, let's rewrite e in terms of lambda. Uh, so one way we could do it is we could just say that k a to the fourth, if we just solve for k a to the fourth up there, that's going to be what? Two lambda over pi. This is equal to two lambda over pi. And so we're going to replace this k a to the fourth with two lambda over pi. So therefore, e is going to be equal to, uh, let's see, we'll get a lambda in the numerator. And then we're going to have a two divided by four. So we'll get a one half in a factor of one half. We're going to have a pi in the denominator. And we get an epsilon naught s and an s hat. Does anyone recognize this expression? This is the, if you had a wire of zero radius, right, an infinitesimally thin wire uh, that had a charge per unit length of lambda, this is the electric field that it would produce. So this is the electric field due to a thin wire with charge per unit Lambda. And so the reason I'm trying to highlight this is because this is a fact that's generally true. If 
If I have a sphere, as long as it's, sorry, let's, let's start with the cylinder. If I have a cylinder uh, that has some finite radius, as long as the charge distribution is symmetric in that, like radially symmetric in that cylinder, once you're at a point outside, it's as if you're looking at the electric field due to an infinitesimally thin wire where all of the charge is concentrated right on the axis of the cylinder. Um, the same thing happens with spheres. If I have a solid sphere that has some charge distribution that's radially symmetric inside of it, then if I look at a point that's outside the sphere, it's as if I have a point charge right at the center with all of the charge concentrated right there. The sphere could even be a shell, so it could have some some cavity in the center, it's still, if you just take the total charge of the shell, put it right at the center at a point, then the electric field that produces outside the shell is like that of a point charge. Okay, good. Yep. Yeah. I guess, or how close to the charge. Yeah. Is, so right. So you're talking about when we calculated Q enclosed? Yeah. For this yeah. yeah. So Q enclosed is, um, so you agree that Q enclosed is the charge density integrated over some volume, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Now, the charge density is KS squared but that's only defined inside of this cylinder. Once I go past that cylinder, there is no more charge density, right? The charge density goes to zero. And so that's why you have to cut that into the lock. Yeah. Could you also think of it as maybe taking the integral of this junction so this is the same radius as our cylinder? Because like no matter how much larger it is, it's not going to change to enclosed. Yeah, it's not going to change Q enclosed. That's right. Um, it's just your S would change as you make it grow. But yeah, you're right. If you chose a surface that was just hugging the outside, you would get everything would be exactly the same. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, what do we have? We have a few minutes left. So let's just do one other thing. Um, we talked about the divergence of the electric field and that gave us the um, differential form of Gauss's law. So let's just think briefly about the curl of the electric field. Okay, um, so let's consider a point charge for which E is equal. It's kind of a elegant thing where superposition allows us to do a lot, doesn't it? Because we can always start with a point charge and then just generalize by saying, well, if I had a bunch of point charges, you just add up the results over and over again for you get similar results. Okay, so what I want to start by doing is thinking about a line integral of E dot DL. And so E is gonna have these constant factors, Q over four pi epsilon naught. And then we're gonna integrate from some position RA to some position RB of one over R squared. And then, uh, well, our DL in general could have any complicated path, but it's going to be dot product with a radial electric field. And so it's the only the radial motion of our displacement that matters. And so after the dot product, only the dr survives. Okay. Um, so that's fine. Uh, if I integrate one over r squared, I get minus one over r. So I'm going to have a one over R minus one over R. And we just have to make sure we get the limits right. So we're going to pick up a minus sign and then we have RB 
1 over RB minus 1 over RA, but then if I bring the minus sign in, I could write this as 1 over RA minus 1 over RB. Okay. But now what we can do is we can say, well, what if I made RA and RB the same? So that I follow a path that could be whatever shape you want, but I'm going to end on the same point that I started at. So if we select RA equal to RB so that we have a closed loop, then it must be the case that this E dot DL is equal to zero because then we're just going to have one over RA minus one over RA and that's going to vanish. Okay, so that's fine. Um, that's We've done this only for a single point charge. So for a collection of point charges, E is equal to E1 plus E2 plus, and so on. Um, so these are a bunch of individual point charges. And so we would have the net electric field is E1 plus E2 plus and so on. And then we're going to do a dot DL. But for each one of these, we're going to get an E1 dot DL around a closed path plus uh, E2 dot DL around a closed path plus and so on. And for each one of these, this is going to vanish. And so it doesn't matter how many point charges you have, it will always be the case that this line integral will be zero. So then what we can do is if we apply Stokes theorem, which says that the integral around a closed path of V dot DL is equal to the integral of the curl of V dot DA. So this would be across a path, this would be over a surface. Um, well, that implies that this E dot DL, which we know is going to be zero, is also equal to the curl of E dotted with some DA. Now, as long as we don't take, like as long as we take an actual path, then that's going to define some surface. So the DA is certainly not zero. And so the only way we can satisfy this equality is by saying that the curl of E must be zero. And so this implies that the curl of E is equal to zero. And this is true for electrostatics. Later, we'll see that if we allow our source charges to move around, we'll have to make a correction. But for now, this is true. So now what we have is a relationship for the flux, which gives us a surface integral of the electric field. And then we can use divergence theorem to get a differential form of Gauss's law. And now what we know is that the integral around a closed path of the electric field would have to be zero, which also implies that the curl of E is zero. Okay, and so that's where we'll pick it up next time. Uh, where we're going to go from here is we're going to start talking about electric potential. And the reason that electric potential will be so useful is because that's a scalar type calculation. We don't have to worry about components and dot products and curls and all that stuff. So if we can find the electric potential due to some distribution of charge, then we can use that to calculate the electric field, as it turns out by taking minus the gradient of the potential. Okay, good. Thanks very much. And we will see you on Wednesday. And that curl is able to